very good evening to everybody. Today, I welcome you in this episode of Eclectica, the different news. And I'm going to bring a guest who will teach us, not teach, but you will learn a lot about academic and research writing, particularly for clinicians. So I have Dr. Jia with me and let me introduce my guest and then we will have a lot of interesting conversation from where you can pick up your points to you know take it a note on all these aspects well dr jia uh, is a board certified nephrologist and an active physician researcher with more than one million dollars of grant funding from the national institutes of health and foundational grants that is nih usa she's also the founder of published me where she coaches clinicians on how to publish research papers, build authority, and achieve their academic goals without the overwhelm. So let me call in my guest today and let us have a fantastic conversation. Hi, Dr. Jia. Thank you so much for uh, accepting my invitation and coming on to this episode of Eclectica, the different views. So glad to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm, um, it's my pleasure being on your channel. And so I have a lot of questions because I think <laughs> we are talking about today academic and research writing. Uh, Jia, I would like to first ask you something like you, you are you are a nephrologist. You have your practice. Probably you are also assistant professor in certain uh, in certain organizations uh, as well, like Northwell uh, Health, if I am not wrong. So uh, doing all these things, keeping your profession, your family, and then you also, you know, take your time to make videos and put out content. I mean, how is that you came into this way of putting out information? What made you motivated in uh, actually sharing your knowledge through social, uh, you know, social networks? Part of it came from my original pain where um, I struggled for a good three years. I finished my master's and came up with zero publications. So that's like really embarrassing. It's like doing medical school and you can't, you don't know how to see a patient. So I had zero publication, but um, I, I somehow could not give up research. So I kind of really, really pushed. After three years, then I saw myself, I was able to publish papers, I was able to get uh, a funding. And then I know all the mistakes I made, all the roadblocks. And I feel like when I talk to people, they start saying, oh, how did you do it? And as people asking me questions, then I started answering them and, and same questions keep coming up. And so I thought, okay, why not put it publicly so people can learn? And so that was my initial intention. And then as I did more of that, I felt like this could be a much bigger uh, purpose because I became a doctor to help patients. But when I see patient one-on-one, -on -one, I can only set help one at a time. I don't know, throughout my lifetime, maybe 500 patients, maybe 1,000 patients, but that's not enough for me. So I went to research because I want to impact. I want, if I help one, pa if I publish one paper, it's, it's helping 1,000 patients at a time. But then that's also quite small. I, I want a goal to help 10 million patients. So then it kind of shifted my mind. If I can help a thousand doctors or clinicians publish a papers and move science forward that means now um thousand times a thousand it becomes 10 million patients so now i have shifted my path towards what can i do to achieve that goal and in my path of achieving that goal is to helping clinicians publish research papers fantastic it's very interesting and thank you for sharing uh, that your uh, uh, motivation and inspiration behind what you are doing today because I think it also inspires other people who are in a similar field or who actually want to start their channel or they want to put out but they hesitate a lot right mm -hmm. so uh, well so coming to my first question uh, which is a very straightforward one that um, how you think is uh, important when it comes to academic writing in the field of uh, clinical research and what impact does it have on a clinician's career to be specific and more for the scientific community? What is your uh, opinion on this? Right. So scientific writing is your, um, it is your final desti destination. So if you don't write, there's no product, right? It's, it's like you do all the research and if you don't publish it, it almost means that you spent three years doing nothing. So a lot of people did the beginning piece and don't like writing and forget that the, the real product, the real product of research is the paper. 
And so if you don't get that to the finish line, you have wasted three years of your life. I mean, you can learn something, but it, for, in terms of the research project, it means nothing to the world. Right? A lot of people think ideas are great, but really execution is king. You need to get it to the finish line. And so scientific writing is the communication of your results and your findings to the world, to the scientific community. And that is the most important part because if people don't know, nobody can build on the shoulders of giants. Right, you are absolutely right. So thank you for that answer. So um, I know that uh, through your uh, endeavors at this moment, you um, you know you also have some co uh, you coach people. You also have some consultancies that you offer. So uh, putting it uh, very straight to you, Jia, like as an academic coach, what are the key elements? Uh, you focus while you mentor clinicians to improve their academic writing skills for research papers. So, so there are two parts. Um, what I see the struggles actually is not even the technical part because a lot of information, um, even the things I put out there are free. You know, you can find it, you can Google, you can find it. And that's actually not the problem. The problem is actually the mindset and being able to sit down and do it. And so a few mindsets I tend to see, um, you know, because a lot of us get into uh, medicine, dentistry, is to help people, right? And then they say, oh, I can't sit down and write a paper. I need to see my patient. I need to take on more patient. And so after I hear that a lot, then I realize that, no, when, when you write a paper, you are helping patients. In fact, you're helping more patients and you're helping your future patients. And so it has to be that mindset shift that typically we have to coach them through. Because if not, oh, I can't sit. You know, writing is not just about typing. It's about, oh, in this session, I am helping patients. And so first is the mindset shift. And then the second struggle is about committing to the writing, like sitting down to actually write it. And a lot of people are not used to creating their own schedule. Um, clinicians are have been trained. You go from medical school, dental school, rest of the, every curriculum has been planned out for you. And then you just need to follow along. But when it's a research career, nobody's giving you a curriculum. Nobody's giving you accountability. Nobody's giving you a structure. So now you, you sit there like, oh, I don't know what to do. And, and the people kind of go back to the default, which is, okay, I guess I will call my patient. Or I guess I will check my email. A, a research project, you always actually need to create this whole plan yourself. And then you have to meet the target. And because of that, people can't, don't know how to switch. And so my, my goal is, so, okay, this is how you switch, how you plan out a project, all the steps you need to do, one, two, three, four, five, then they can do it. It's not just the information. It's about creating the steps to get from point A to point the final, final destination. Great, great. I think that's very interesting. Uh, I mean, and the insights that you are sharing through your experiences of coaching, I think it's, it's really valuable. So um, uh, just, Gia, I was wondering that, uh, since you have been into coaching consultancy a lot uh, now, so could you share some of the common challenges uh, or pitfalls that clinicians often face while writing academic papers in clinical research? And how do you guide them to overcome these obstacles? That would be very interesting to know. <laughs> yeah, I can even start with my own, own problem because, as I said, three years, I did not publish a paper. You know, I finished it. Um, my struggle, because I, I'm English is not my first language. So um, when I wrote, there's a lot of grammatical error. The first thing, my English, written English is not good. I can speak, but but the, the foundation wasn't there. That is one skill I did not have. And then second skill, academic writing was a separate skill. And so um, the first, I actually almost have to, kind of went, I went back to YouTube, learn the foundations of English. How, what's a good sentence? You know, went back to the foundation. Once I had that, then I started building on the academic writing. And so there are two parts. One is the science itself. What is important in, in, in communicating in science? And number two is developing the style of writing. Because this, there's a, this style of it that, that people want to imagine how it's going to flow out, but actually this not. So there's actually some recipe uh, to, to create that. Like, you know, you need to make it concise. You need to have an argument. So these are the small bits that when you start learning the skill one at a time, and you, you then it starts building up. And then the next thing you know, 
You do one skill and then you build on the next skill, your paper becomes a lot better. So it's about taking um, a skill set. It's not one skill. Like writing is not one skill. Writing is, you know, maybe a hundred of micro skills. And usually what I coach is, um, let's break that down. This is what you need. This is what you need. This is what you need. Let's build the one skill first. Then you finish and you move on to the next skill. Like, like in medicine, you, you do one skill first, then you move on. So then you stack it up. Once you stack it up, and then it, you get better. And then um, in terms of how to get started with style, um, in one easy trick I used was when I first started was to do copy work. That means you take a research paper that you, you think is quite good, and you just copy word for word. So that means you type very slowly and you say it up. And when you keep doing that over and over again, maybe for just 15 minutes a, a day for a whole week, suddenly your, your brain has downloaded like the style. You keep hearing, however, this is how people say, you know, the, the sentence flow. That's how you, that's how you kind of download the style of writing very quickly, but you still need some foundations on, okay, why people use it this way, why people say it that way. Um, why is results always written that way? Why is discussion always written that way? So understanding the formula and also practicing yourself, that is how you start um, get uh, get better in writing. Thank you, Jia, for that you know practical insights. And, and you know, uh, I think your experience through your challenges that you wanted to solve uh, has brought you up with this plethora of knowledge that with which you are helping many people who are in need of this, really. I mm -hmm. mean, that's, that's really uh, wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, uh, what specific strategies are, or probably some techniques, would, uh, do you employ to help clinicians effectively organize their thoughts and structure their academic papers in the context of particularly clinical research? Because that is what we are uh, looking into. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um the, the mistakes, actually, I see is people try to read all the papers, you know, they read paper and paper and paper, and then they, they, they hope that they will find something and it reorganizes in the brain. But it, it's almost like, let me open Google and let Google bring me all the papers, all the articles, all the links, then I know what to, you know, what to talk about. It doesn't work that way. When you Google, you need to have a specific question. Then you look for it. And so when people write, they start with, let me do a literature review, but there's no specific question. So instead you should reverse it. Reverse it by, what is my question first? Specific question like, um, you know, how big is the problem? Why is this happening? What are the risk factors? If this is a risk factor, what has people tried to answer? Why hasn't it been solved? So when you have all these big questions, then you can start brainstorming. Okay, maybe that's why. You can also start like writing your answers first. Um, you don't want to stifle your creativity just by um, only reading paper. Because the, the interesting part, the scientific and the, the, the value of the science is how the researcher is able to pull this part and that part from different research and combine it. So if you only wait for a research paper to kind of give you inspiration, it, it's difficult. So it almost seems like you have to start from yourself. You ask the questions, you try to piece it together using uh, uh, from your intuition first. So you, you almost need to start with the question, answer them based on your own clinical expertise and, and um, a previous intuition. Answer those questions first. Now you start looking at the literature review. That is how you form a cohesive um, framework when you start writing, not the other way around. Great, great. Thank you, Jiwa, for that answer. It was uh, very specific and step by step. And, and that reverse grader approach that you told is really interesting. So, uh, Jiwa, in your experience, what are some ethical considerations that clinicians should be mindful? of when writing academic papers, particularly in clinical research. So um, uh, to clarify, ethical concern like regulatory stuff, applying for ethics committee, is, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there are two parts to this. First is when designing the study, right? 
it, it needs to go through um, proper channels, proper regulatory um, approval. In the U.S., we call it, call it IRB. In some other countries, they call it ethics committee. So you need to make sure it goes through that before you even start the, the study. And the most common complaint I hear when, when people need to do this, oh, these people, they want to stop my study. They want to obstruct. They, you know, they're just there to be administrator. So, so I want to re a, a, a shift in, in thinking about this, okay? If you think about it, when you do clinical research, patients need to take on some risks. It can be low risk, it can be medium risk, but it's still a risk because they are, they are giving you their private health information you never know, you know, you, you lose, uh, that's confidentially. So they are putting your risks on their line for your research that doesn't, may not even, even benefit them, right? So when you're putting somebody on a risk, isn't it ethical to make sure the research project works well? Isn't it ethical to make sure the project you plan is not full of flaws, right? If it's, if it's full of flaw and it's a useless study, and now you're putting a risk to the patient, that is very unethical. So that's the part. So I need everybody to kind of reshift the to shift the frame of thinking that when I submit a paper to the IRB committee, they are not there to to be obstruct, uh, obstructive. They are there to protect the patient. So think of that. So and as a researcher, that's our own goal, right? That's the first part. And so you want to make sure the the con informed consent is in the lay language so that people are not just signing their life away, not understanding. Right, and and you want to make sure uh, uh, the design is well. Inclusion, exclusion criteria is not um, biased to a sp specific group. You're not targeting and then causing more harm to a specific group. Um, and and the outcomes that you study must be meaningful to the people you're studying. So there are a lot of components to that um, in in terms of the ethical concern. And then now, once you've gotten that, you know, you do your study, and then your your results are out. And the ethical concern in terms of writing is you need to publish it, right? The right you need to publish it. If you don't, that is not ethical because you make through make them do all these three years of recruitment, you're putting them at risk, and then there's nothing to show for. So when you put them on a in a risk, right? So it, it must be uh, uh, publication is key. And second thing is when you write the paper, do not um, Make sure the data supports your conclusion. A lot of people overstate their conclusion, overstate the data interpretation, right? So, so it's not like you don't, you can't tell a story, but it needs to, the evidence needs to support uh, your claims. That's really important because that, that's the right thing to do. Thank you, Jia. Thank you for that answer. <clears throat> well, so, um, you know, how do you assist clinicians in balancing technical precision with readability in their academic writing for clinical research, ensuring that their work is accessible to both experts and a broader audience? Well, that's a great question. Actually, there are two parts. You know, um, research papers are only meant for researchers. Okay. Right. Broad audience, um, it's a different format of writing. So I, I do two types of writing. I write my academic papers, and that one, I make sure there's technical precision. I use the right words. I don't, um, if I mean clinic, uh, statistical significance, I use clinical statistical significance. I don't say massive. I don't say um, really, you know, I don't use words that is subjective. I use very specific technical words to mean specific data. So that's for academic writing. And um, when it comes to a broader audience, then what I do is when I'm done publishing the paper, there are other channels, um, like some blog called, I think, Science Kudos, where you uh, take your paper and then you write it in lay language and, um, and then you can put that on the blog. And, and specifically, that's a scientific blog that is meant for lay people. You can also write it for... Um, different magazines. Um, if you're in specific fields, sometimes they have magazines. I, I write for Kidney News. It is more for doctors, but it's also kind of pared down a little bit, less scientific, more of a, a narrative, like, like talking a story. So there are different channels. So you have to understand who your audience is. So you can't write for this audience and write it in a different style. 
if, if you want a broad lay audience, we write it in a different style. And then finally, more recently, many journals, they actually have a little small section that is give five points on the summary of your paper, but this is targeted to the lay people so that um, it is just a snippet so people summarize, they know what's the main reason for your study and what's the final finding. And that way, uh, they, these part can be picked up by uh, sometimes news agencies, sometimes picked up by sort of medical blog. They, they use it for lay public. Yeah, thank you, Gia. And uh, I completely agree with you. And when you talk about magazine, then I definitely like to mention about our magazine, which we have been running from 2018. It's a free e magazine named as Genomedin. And it's there we cover a lot of, uh, you know, uh, health innovations and uh, genetics, genomics, saliva, lifestyle disorder, and probably career growth tips, medical writing, and a lot of stuff. So I'm so happy to know that you contribute in, um, you know, in different kinds of uh, news magazines as well. So I would, uh, on a public forum, I invite you to, uh, you know, put up, put up something for our uh, magazine as well, because it is free for everybody, for the author, for the public to see. So thank you. Thank you for Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're doing a wonderful you're doing a wonderful job i must say so um well uh, coming to a little bit more technical question uh, to you gia that uh, like you know we uh, like as you uh, correctly said about statistics data so when a person is starting up particularly clinicians and uh, any researcher for that say when they get into this practice of writing papers uh, i even from my experiences i have seen that this part of like data statistics these are a little daunting to them so mm -hmm. um, can you share some practical tips or best practices practices for clinicians to understand how to integrate data statistics or probably visual aids uh, effectively so that uh, they're uh, you know into their academic writing uh, for particularly uh, putting up clinical research so what would be uh, some of the tips that you could share with us mm -hmm. that would be really helpful okay that's a great question so I, I've experienced this when I was training in residency, thinking that that's all I need. But actually, as I kind of went through my whole proper master's, is these are two separate skills. Writing is one whole skill. Clinical research is one whole skill. Data statistics is one whole skill. That's why people go through a two-year or three-year master's, and sometimes we go through a PhD, because it's a very different skill. You can't just join a mentor and absorb the data statistic. It doesn't work that way. Um, it's a very whole um, uh, different skill set. So you need to understand study design. You need to know what comes in the study design, why you choose the study design, and why not choose that study design. What is the bias that comes with it? What is, you know, what's the pros and cons? What can you answer with this study design and what can you not? So unless that is like a whole different uh, um typically a whole module in a course in a master's, okay? There are free um, information out there from Coursera. These are all free. I think even Skillshare, uh, there's so many courses out there that are free, okay? Then data and statistics. The first thing people tell me, oh, I need statistical software. That is not your, that is not a problem yet. The problem is knowing what all these little words mean. You know, what does p-value mean? What does OS ratio mean? Why did you choose this test? Why did you choose that test, right? Even having that little bit of foundation, is, it, it makes a lot of difference when you work with a statistician because the statistician can help you, but if you don't know what variables mean, they, they, you're like, oh, this, there's no language. You, you need to build the, the language. It's, it's exactly, it's like learning a new language. You need to know the words first. Once you know that, then you can learn the skill. You may not need to know be the, the best data scientist out there, but at least you need the foundation so that when you have someone to work with you, you can come together and use the same language. So, so that's what my recommendation is. There's no quick tip when it comes to study design, data science, because these are three, um, now these two are two separate category. Academic writing is a completely different set category. 
thank you Jia, for that uh, you know very nice clarification and uh, giving us the insight that what is what because yes as you rightly said that it seems like uh, we when we when it comes to research writing it seems like that we need to know everything but that's not practically possible and uh, i think the bridge that you talked about of uh, bringing uh, or building a bridge of communication oh, yes. even we, if we are seeking help from a statistician that is very important so jia as an as an nih funded researcher what role does the peer review process play in academic writing for clinical research and how do you guide clinicians in addressing reviewer comments and improving the quality of their papers mm, okay so when it comes to grant funded researcher that's a whole another level of peer review so i'm going to start focusing on the 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 level of research papers first, not grant writing, okay? So let's focus on research papers. When it comes to research papers, um, sometimes even just preparing for the peer review is really important. Before you submit the paper, start thinking, what are the objections? If, so, so that you don't go into this, oh, I can't, I can't believe they asked that. I, uh, why did they crit critique my paper? So, so you don't go unprepared. You start by thinking, oh, let me read my paper. And if you're in a field, if you have a good mentor and good collaborator, they will know the field well, and they will know what are the common things people comment on. And so start with that, like, huh, if there are common objections, address it, right? For one example, I had this paper where we found a very interesting finding, and we're like, oh, I hope the reviewers will notice. So we, we kind of all did not talk about it. We swept it under the rug. And when the peer review came back, all five of them said, oh, can you explain this? Why, why did this result happen that way? So if you feel the gut feeling, you, you know, it's, it's, it's going to come up. So, so it, it's better for you to just go ahead, push it and write it through and try to figure out why that is happening. So that's the first thing. Okay. Second thing is, um, uh, let's talk about why papers get rejected. Usually one is a research question not being good, not novel. Number two, the, the English or the writing is too sloppy, okay? And the third thing is it doesn't match with the journal's uh, um, uh, topic or it doesn't match, it doesn't fit the journal, okay? So it doesn't fit the journal, nothing we can do. You have to choose the right paper, okay? Um, study design being poor, that you need to prepare early be uh, during the study design, okay? That, that, that one is kind of too late now. The third one is sloppy writing, okay? The, the peer review process itself, the goal is not to fix your writing. But a sloppy writing makes us bias you. It makes us think of the authors in a different way. And so in, in the way where if this person can't even write a paper properly, when we see comma instead of a decimal point, I wonder how careful the authors are when they do the study. Are they collecting the data properly? Did they design the study properly? Can I trust their data? Can I trust? The, the main reason for peer review is, can I trust them? Is it valid? Because you're the gatekeeper. Peer review is they want to make sure the science is good so that people are not having bad science out there and that people build up on bad science. So that's the goal of the peer reviewer. And when we review, it's really about, is this question important or not? If it's not important, reject. Okay, if it's important, the study method, Okay, is it good? Is it valid? Is it the right way to study? If it's not good, can it be fixed? If it cannot be fixed, it's such a major flaw, we check. If it's okay, maybe they just need to tweak a little bit, then we give our comments. Okay? And then finally, then we talk about the writing. Okay, the writing is not so good. You may need to like shift the frame a bit this way. You may need to add more evidence. Why do you say all these things without any evidence, without anything to support? So, so we go through layers, but... The most important is the research question and then followed by the methods and then followed by the, the overall structure of the story. Thank you. Thank you, Jia, for that wonderful answer. So um, coming to almost the concluding part of our conversation today, uh, uh, my another interesting question would be like, if you can give us some examples of uh, common mistakes or errors that clinicians should avoid in their academic writing for you know, for clinical research, uh, based like 
whatever your experience because i guess that you have met a lot of people by now mm-hmm. with your coaching and consultancy so i think if we can highlight those mistakes uh, and how they can avoid them that would be really helpful okay um the the number one mistake is not realizing writing is a separate skill and that writing um is actually a communication skill because writing you are not just typing words the reason for writing that paper is you are communicating with the scientific community and it's not a one way street you're not just i'm telling you this when you re- read a research paper it's actually a conversation between you and the scientific community you almost anticipate what they ask and so you answer it you anticipate what's a common question and then you answer it so realizing writing is not a words on paper but a communication between you and scientists so it's a very high level very highly cognitively demanding skill and so you need to actually have a clear mind to do it you need to have time to do it you need to be committed to do it to doing it and it's a skill that needs to be built if your foundation is poor it takes longer to get there if you have a pretty good foundation then it gets faster so you can't really compare why I started research at this time another colleague started at the same time they published five papers and I until now I can even do um a pa- um publish my first paper so we may start at the same point but we are all running different races we all start from different places so understanding where you are is really important and knowing where you need to be is also important because you you know where you are and you think oh I just need to do this it may not be enough you need to actually work a lot harder to build yourself to catch up to other people's level and then now you can be at the level playing field so so that is kind of the mindset shift and being able to commit knowing yourself and knowing where you need to go then you can be successful so i think that's the biggest mistake people not realizing that um uh, uh, this whole concept of academic writing I think I learned a lot from uh, this conversation conversation itself because uh, I have been into this field for uh, for some time but then I think the insights that you were providing it's it's really helpful thank you Jia thank you once again My so um, <laughs> so what are some emerging trends or innovative approaches in academic writing uh, that clinicians should be aware of uh, to stay to the forefront in their fields Great question. So so now a lot of you must might have heard of all the artificial intelligence, chat GPT, all the apps are coming up. Don't be afraid. When a new technology comes in, you jump right in. Okay? Especially one that is is so useful, okay? And the the reason you want to join in is because you want to learn how it works. You don't want to be left behind. You don't want to be the that that professor who can't type emails. and will print out all emails and write and get somebody to type it back. You know, you don't want to be that type of person. You want to be able to, okay, this is a new tool. I can do it because these are just tools. Okay? First understanding, don't be afraid and jump right into learn. Second thing is um knowing the ethical part of writing. So, when you want to use these, understand what are you using it for? These are not to um replace your thinking. The researchers value is how they kind of synthesize multiple things and push things forward. Your value is in the thinking and writing is difficult because writing is thinking. Okay? So use ChatGPT, use all the AI not to replace your thinking but to augment your thinking. So I use ChatGPT all the time. So first thing I use it to improve my writing. How I do that is I throw my paragraph into it, okay? I say help me make it more concise. that is one but you don't end there you want to and explain why my writing is not good give me feedback on my writing and if it's not good why is it give me suggestions right then they will show you okay your paragraph one here uh, they can give you feedback uh, you need to tell me okay it it i i i understand it's clear is um it is clear but there are some sentences that are does not flow well and that's why it could be confusing then the next question okay tell me why is it confusing then they will even tell me oh because you put this word here and that word there then it it gets confusing but this needs a little bit of language to know how to ask questions but um but don't let them hold you back 
just use it and try and see how to make me better. I use it as my mentor. I use it to um, understand how to to understand peer review, how to respond to peer review. I was like, okay, this is my answer. How do you reframe it to make it sound more polite? You know, all these little tricks you can use to help augment your work faster. Final thing also, um, let's say you have to use it for um, your career development as a researcher, okay? Sometimes they need you to um, uh, uh, create a career development plan. Oh, what is your three-year plan? What I, I asked it, okay, what are the, these are my five skills I need to learn. Can you create a table and a show potential uh, timeline? Or if I want to write a project this way and I need to um, create a project plan, can you give me a sample target or milestones I need to uh, achieve to, to get to my paper, to get to this study design? So you use it for different ways, but first learn how to uh, learn the platform and, and that way you can be a super user of it. Thank you, Gia. Thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful talking to you and learning so much from you. And I think uh, you have, uh, you know, you have given very practical insights from your experiences. And I think whoever is listening to us or they will watch this video later, uh, they will find a lot of value uh, in this. Just before going away, I would just like to uh, ask you that if somebody wants to contact you for your coaching or consultancy, so. Uh, could you help us with your, uh, you know, information where they can, you know, get in touch with you? Sure. Um, you can email me at um, info at publishedmd.com, like um, published paper. Uh, so it's info at publishedmd.com. But, you know, sometimes I would say just know more about me first, you know, you won't, before you join in a coach. Sometimes you want to like, do I like this style? Do I like this person? Do I trust? So so don't just, you know, watch some of my videos. I have a YouTube channel, publishmd.com. If you are on LinkedIn, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn. Sometimes it takes me time because, you know, when you get a lot of connection requests, but um, ask me questions, read my posts because I put a lot of free content out there. I do Twitter, I do LinkedIn as well. Um, so, so get connected feel like if you like my style then yes we can work together right right thank you Gia thank you so much and I hope we'll meet in uh, in the future uh, you know for more such conversations and I really appreciate your your time thank you my pleasure thank you so much for having me take care <laughs>